the task is, which is the cultured one, which is the real one. Yeah. And they're very, very similar. That is how close we can get to the real skin. We're making real pieces of living skin, which we make in the lab. In the past and still, a lot of researchers use animal models. The mouse is not a human. You just look at the science, it's just not good enough. It needs replacement, you need to move on if you want to make better cures and medicines for the patients, drugs. You have to think, when I was a student, particularly in the biomedical science, it was just accepted that you do the animal experiments, eh? Uh, and so I thought, no, 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 that's not going to happen. <laughs> it's not for me. Yeah, but why, why should you do uh, uh, experiments in living animals when you don't need to? There is a certain degree of suffering and burden to the animal. If there is an alternative way to do that without the burden to the animal, it should be used. It's called a chip because it's actually a sort of bioreactor. This is the chamber where the skin is. And here we have a, a chamber where the reserve medium is. And this is another chamber where you can put another organ of choice. Yeah, the main thing is at the moment, the organoids are very much as single organoids. Eh? You have skin, or you have gut, or you have heart, or you have liver, but they're not connected. And in the animal model, in the human, they are connected. It's what we call systemic effects. For instance, you apply something to the skin and that penetrates the skin. Will it have an effect on your liver or your kidney or something? We are starting to get into that area now. A lot of people say you can't go into organoid models because what about systemic immunotoxicity? He's decided, can we actually reproduce this now with multi-organ on a chip? And then you see what is happening in the skin model to mimic the very first steps of a systemic immunotox reaction. It was a case when I started out saying I'm not using any animal models. Uh, I was pretty much isolated and I'm not really somebody who stands up and shouts and say you do this, you do that, should be done this way or that way. And then uh, yeah that transition just started to happen and then uh, you realise then that you can actually suddenly start speaking up and saying this is the way it should be done, yeah, this is a better way. Yeah, it's obvious. Uh, you're, there's so many mouse models being presented here because the, the cell-based models aren't good enough yet. And it is a huge challenge, uh, but that is fun. Scientists like a challenge. And it is really nice then to see other people getting interested in all these uh, different technologies and models and asking, uh, can we also do it? Can you show us how? And uh, seeing these uh, students, uh, PhD students coming into the lab with hardly any lab experience to start off with, and then just seeing them develop into young researchers and get them as motivated as I am to do it that way. And then they're all really, really going for it. Yeah. This is Elisabetta, and she's one of our PhD students in her final year. It was really nice to see actually what you can do without animals, what you can achieve. Because I work in cancer research and the animals are like still like the major model that are used. The students really see, yeah, this is possible. And then they see the next step as well, which is going to be their career. That they're going to be the people who really implement the uh, alternative methods. They're, they're early career scientists be part of like the new generation. That was really something that for me was a huge part of why I really wanted to be in this lab actually. Good. You'll get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah.